much love to Brother Marcus for allowing me to be a host today again. Uh, I'm back again and uh, hopefully many more times. Um, I wanted to start off by asking, uh, what was like your initial introduction to being in the field you're in? And for those who don't know, I know you're a little well known around the city, but for those who don't know, please tell them what you do. Uh, so uh, I am a filmmaker. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm from the South Side of Chicago, Auburn Gresham. Okay. Uh, uh, went down to University of Illinois, played two sports down there, okay. got injured, came back to Chicago, started as a talent in the entertainment industry. Okay. Um, oddly enough, I went from being a linebacker, dropped about 70 pounds, and they used to do runway. Now I see it. <laughs> now I see it. I see the, I I see the do, stock. I used, to, uh, I used to model, man, on Billboard, like all that type of stuff. But it was a natural progression to get into um, acting, commercial work. Okay. And then... Uh, from that went on to you know Second City and training mm -hmm. there and oh, okay. um, things of that nature. So that's how I met a lot of comedians and performers. I'm not a stand-up comedian. I just was in that space a okay. lot. I was training for improv okay. uh, to be a better actor. Um, so eventually, I uh, you know you get tired of waiting for an opportunity. You get yeah. tired of uh, waiting for a casting director to say mm -hmm. we like you, we want to cast you in this. And I had always had a a knack for bringing people together and yeah. being a community leader so I just applied that as an entertainer so I was on set networking from everybody from craft services to the directors and eventually you know over time people know you they know you're a good person it's all mm -hmm. a relationship business it really anyway. is it really, really um, is. and at the end of the day you know if I'm gonna be on set with you for 18 hours I need to know you you cool you know you're gonna, mm -hmm. you're gonna be chill so that helped a yeah. lot I also come from a background uh, family full of clergy and business leaders so all of that good. stuff added yeah. into me just being in this field I just applied it and so a lot of what I've been able to do hasn't just been because of maybe you know uh, the artistry of being mm -hmm. a filmmaker or performer uh, it's because of those other things those intangibles that I apply I really feel like I could have been in any profession I still would have applied those things to yeah. it uh, but before I came to Chicago there was one thing that really at least planted the seed and that was my sophomore year of college I was in Atlanta which is like my second home mm -hmm. and my family was um, they uh, managing a property in the area that Tyler Perry was filming oh, okay. uh, one of his films and long story short I wanted to be an extra in the film because the casting director saw me leaving out next thing you know the next day I'm sitting down in a one-on-one -on -one with Tyler Perry just like this okay. and uh, presents the opportunity for me to continue as an inter in the entertainment industry and I had to re I respectfully declined yeah. at the time because I had not invested in the entertainment industry I didn't think that's where I was going I was a sophomore yeah. playing college ball and I thought that that's what it was going to be uh, so when that was clearly not my not my future when I came back to Chicago that's when everything else I just mentioned kind of took off so in the back of my head I had already seen a black man at you know making decisions at a level yeah at a very like, high level at a very high level so when I'm on set and I'm I'm just paying attention to everything I'm just thinking to myself like man there's not there's not a lot of us around here if any yeah. <laughs> you yeah. know but I saw what was possible yeah and so when I would see certain things that I felt that could either be done better or tweaked here and there or mm -hmm. even just um, from a from a communications and branding standpoint you know you you want to attract a certain demographic or or population to consume your product listen to whatever you you're saying mm -hmm. but that's not what you're giving them you know yeah. that's not the product you're giving that's not what you're distributing yeah. how you're going to attract that's, millennials uh, how you're going to attract more man. diversity yeah. and again it just it went back to me paying attention to decision makers mm -hmm. it just appeared to me that uh, the individuals making the decisions were not the same people that they were trying to sell a product to exactly uh, and, and that there, was and the there's case a, and there's a large disconnect and it's kind of now it's becoming more obvious because we see people from mm -hmm. closer to our generation right making uh, more of a splash in that industry because they're not so far removed from the audience they're trying to appeal to yeah yeah and a lot of it is just I was listening to I think it was the dream mm -hmm. and he was talking about Jay-Z and the guy was just asking on the interview was like man what makes Jay-Z so different he's like he's just smarter than everybody <laughs> but not in the sense that yeah. like there's something magical that someone else doesn't have they're like if you pay attention to a lot of stuff he does he just pays attention, attention. it's <laughs> like it. 
you it's not you guys can't you can see everybody's looking at the same thing right mm -hmm. you want you, you want a, a diverse audience to listen to what you are you are um, you you are producing or watching yeah. you're producing but your board is not diverse nope <laughs> no one in the decision making room is yep. diverse yep. and so you're going to you're going to sp spend so much time trying to figure it out yeah when really where you just need to start at is just you different gotta, background people with different backgrounds up a little yeah. bit and so what happens is you take that environment you take a person like me that comes from that background, mm -hmm. and then there is, yeah, I was a linebacker, so there is some tenaciousness yeah. <laughs> in what I do, but, but you take that and Creative Cypher works mm -hmm. because it's doing something that institutions and entities that have resources to do just don't because yeah. they don't get it. Mm -hmm. So, you know, at the end of the day, I, I feel grateful to be able to do what I'm doing. Uh, as a resource bank, being meaning Creative Cipher, but a lot of it is is literally just execution. It's not a new idea. It's yeah. just as Barack Obama said, "We are who we're waiting for." <laughs> you do it. There it is. So uh, is that kind of why? So the the diversifying a board or like having more of a connection to the community or the 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 demographic you're trying to appeal to is that more the reason why you chose behind the scenes because I know you said you started off as a talent at least in the sense of modeling and voice acting mm -hmm. and a few other things so is is the diversification of the board or like having making sure that the community you you grew up in are like are now like giving resources to now has that connection to like okay we're supplying to this community so we need people that reflect this community behind here men women of color uh, and of different backgrounds and different levels of, uh, you know, of, uh, I want to well, say. Well, I think yeah. for, for uh, well, I should say, I know for Creative Cypher, the diversity part became, was, was organically a part of the conversation. It wasn't the initial conversation. The initial conversation was, we don't ever want to be in a position where we have to ask for permission, period. That's that was it. That's, yeah. So, in that's order to idea. do that, and you start to study the game, then you start to realize, okay, this is why this group doesn't have access. Mm -hmm. This is why this group has to ask for permission. This is why this group has to sign to a label. This is why this group has to sell their intellectual property mm -hmm. to a studio. Yeah. And then you start to see, oh, the reason for that is because none of us are in that boardroom. Mm -hmm. Then it turns into, well, how do we get in that boardroom? So mm -hmm. originally, it, I can't say that I knew that that's not be what, there. that wasn't it is what naturally I thought it was became, be. I can it was just it was a journey it was like yeah, okay how I do we fix that. this problem how do we fix this problem oh the problem ain't right the problem's not yeah. right here From foundation the problem yeah, yeah. is over here yeah so now we got to change that and so when we built creative cypher it wasn't about reinventing the wheel it was about making sure that artists had access to resources a creative family and educational programming mm -hmm. because we don't want to just give resources at, without some type of um you know, uh, skill set or tutelage or something that needs some advisory yeah. because we want it to last. Uh, and you know, that's why we call Creative Cipher a bank. You know, we call it a bank. It's and it, it is it has become what what is known as a social ecosystem. And everything within that, think of it as a garden. That's Creative Cipher. And mm -hmm. everything that comes out of that garden are the different projects. Good Network okay. is a project that came out of it. Uh, Comedy Night is a project that came, came out of it. it. The okay. film, they're all projects. But what we wanted to do was, again, because our mindset was how do we get to a point where we're decision makers? It yeah. can't be, you know, here's mm -hmm. my portfolio. I did this project, yep. that project. It's like we need to be tapped into the infrastructure. Period. Period. Yeah. Because th then we can we can actually make a difference in the Absolutely. community. Of, yeah, most yeah. definitely. Um, so speaking on that, so what what sparked the idea for Comedy Night? Was it you being involved in Second City and kind of being involved with that comedy scene, and just naturally saying like, you know what, let's make our own now. Like you know what I mean? Let's make our own. Put a lot of resources into it and see where it goes from there. Okay. No, again, it was just another. It was another <laughs> journey. It was <laughs> it was another one of those things where. We started down one track, mm -hmm. and then I've always, I shouldn't say always, but I've grown to become, you know, a person that really counts, you know, their blessings. Mm -hmm. You know, you, oftentimes we're surrounded by resources and individuals, but if we just talk to one another and know yeah. one another needs, we're able to achieve a lot more through collaboration. Mm -hmm. So with that being said, um, a lot of the initiatives and pro uh, projects that I've been able to do have, have come to fruition because I said, wait a minute, I would we would be working on something. I said, mm -hmm. yeah, I do know 
individuals that can do that. Yeah, I do know a bunch of people. I do have access. But Comedy Night came out of an, initially I was um, I was elected to the board of directors for the African American Arts Alliance, which is one of the several boards that I sit on. And uh, the goal was to attract a younger audience to black ensemble theater. That was the goal. At the same time, however, Jokes and Notes had closed on 47 and King okay. Drive, which uh, came out of all jokes aside years oh, ago. Okay. So there was no platform for black and brown comedians yeah. in Chicago. Black Ensemble wanted a younger audience. Cypher Live, the event that we, we, we mm -hmm. used to put on for yeah. our creatives, attracted the audience that Black Ensemble wanted, but we would do these multidisciplinary events and we'd have comedians. And mm -hmm. so we wound up putting on live events to showcase the film projects, mm. but we would have a spoken word artist, a comedian, and different elements a part of it. And I said, well, wait a minute. I think I could produce a comedy show. It, to me, it seems like I've got the venue, we've got a purpose, we've got access, mm -hmm. we've got the performers, we've got the audience, it should work. And on a Monday night, which is not an easy night to do an hey, event. it's packed. I see it uh, every time. All the way up north, uh, we packed Black Ensemble. Ryan Fest performed at it. It yeah, was a so great cool. event. And I found myself being in this position like a Russell Simmons, you know, with mm -hmm. Def Jam. Creative Cypher, to me, was like Def Jam to Russell. Because mm -hmm. Def Jam was an entity that allowed Russell to do other things. Mm -hmm. Creative Cypher has allowed me to do things other like things, produce a comedy definitely. show. Yeah. And being a filmmaker, I didn't want it to just be a, a live event. So we filmed everything. So we have three one-hour specials now in the bank that That's we're about good. to pitch to Netflix and some other deals they gonna take because it. <laughs> we have yeah. the resources to put that together. But again, a lot of it was just saying, okay, here's a problem. We want to solve it. And what do we already have access to to make it happen? And then understanding that we have value that a lot of these institutions need to stay relevant. Yeah. Basically, all they're saying is we need some black people in here. Mm -hmm. That's not necessarily <laughs> what Black Ensemble needed. Yeah. They needed they their their need was younger audience. So creative side for you have um, uh, multi ethnic. You know, um, you have diverse, multi talented, tech savvy. Uh, content creators, mm -hmm. uh, influencers, those are all things that brands want to be a part of. So yeah. we built this thing that they all wanted a piece. So like you guys want access, we want access. There it is. So um, I'm, we're going to come back more to the, the community you're talking about because I actually love that. That's, something, that's literally the reason why I decided to get into being a platform that I am and providing performance spaces as well or performance venues to artists who kind of don't understand how to get into that space in the industry. But I want to learn more about, I think people want to hear more about you personally just just a little bit I'm not gonna get into some of the other stuff but I do want to know more about uh, I see just from social media and from talking to you from time to time over the years you're always traveling every single time we talk you're traveling somewhere California New York somewhere like you even just said you're traveling somewhere somewhere next week I know it's for family purposes but yeah. regardless you seem to be someone who frequents a lot of places around a lot of entertainment centers around the nation so I want to initially say like what are some of your favorite just cities in the in the nation just Some of my general. favorite cities, uh, I'm going to say Atlanta. I, I grew up between Chicago and Marietta, Georgia. Okay. That was, um, so that's home. I got a lot yeah. of family. Most of my family is Chicago, Atlanta, Nashville, L.A. Mm -hmm. That's where we kind of spread out. So, okay. you know, Atlanta's home. Uh, so that was cool. And I can always say that that's really where I got my start. Yeah. You most know? definitely. You just, yeah. You just but, um, you know, L.A., you know, I, I enjoy L.A. Um, to a de to a degree, because when I go there, I go there for a purpose. Yeah, when I'm there, I really um, don't just sightseeing and just yeah, and you, just you know, just I, I've done it once, but I've always been there for something. For so I've always had definitely. you know an agenda, and it's always mm -hmm. it's, it's worked you know smoothly for me. Uh, Miami's cool, um, you know. I I don't. Hmm. I, New York was okay. <laughs> I enjoyed it again. I was there for a project, but they had me stand in Times Square. So, uh, like, after day two, I'm like, all right, I get it. Yeah. <laughs> all the lights and that. Yeah. <laughs> so, you got to close the window. Turn this off now. Because like, Chicago is, you know, to me, it seems like a nice, 
uh, middle ground between LA. LA is just what I keep laid hearing. back, but you need a car, man. It's to go everywhere. So Everything out. is so spread. I've, I haven't even been to LA yet, but we just went to San Francisco, and it's very, very, very far spread out. Yeah, like nothing is close. I think if if I didn't have you know, I, I'm grateful that I have family in those places, and I think yeah. that that's really the most important thing. Mm -hmm. L.A., of course, is the mecca. That's where everything. That's where a lot of things are going on. Although Chicago is is it has broken records every year as far as production revenue generated. Yeah. But if I didn't have the family I have in L.A., I don't know if L.A. would be that you know that center with with that center. So so what what would the best place for entertainment be? Would you say from the places you just listed, L.A., New York, and uh, oh, I mean, Atlanta? Yeah, it's still gonna be Atlanta. Atlanta? That's <laughs> no, what I keep LA. hearing. That's what I keep yeah. hearing. Yeah, I got, lot, I got a lot of family down there too. Actually, when I first started doing audio, one of my biggest mentors was a family member who was down there. He's just saw like, yeah, like you know, superstars or whoever producer all, like comes in, uh, comes in and contacts somebody after you get your name out there. Like somebody will come looking for you eventually. Like as long as you're in the sp like as long as you're in the scene and you're like mm -hmm. out there. He's he's just an audio engineer, so he's always working on stuff at a school. So inevitably, it's like oh, somebody's nephew or cousin probably. Told someone like, hey, yeah, my, my my TA at my audio engineering school, blah blah blah. But uh -huh. I've been hearing that that was like since 2000, like eight. So I've been hearing it since then. I know it's been going on before then because he was an older person. So I was like, oh, there's actually a big scene down here that I'm not aware of. And now since social media is like kind of put a super like a super light on that, and we got studios down there with the people always filming in Georgia. Marvel's always filming in yeah, Georgia. Yeah, I didn't even know until <laughs> a couple of months ago. Black Panther film in Georgia. Uh, what well, specifically <laughs> on Tyler Perry's lot? Oh, they shot on that. Tyler Perry. Like that dude, man. I'll never forget that when we wrapped up that meeting, uh, he gave me contact information that since that time mm -hmm. has been dissolved because they went through a lot of changes. Yeah. But he was like, I'll be making movies for a long time, and and my. I could only conceive that he was saying just making the movies. I had yeah. no idea the of the space. gravity, yeah. like the idea. This dude is buying. This dude is buying naval uh, air force bases. Like that's not yeah. a normal purchase. Nah, you know, you're not <laughs> like renting a studio. This yeah. dude is buying the space military thing. bases and turning <laughs> that stuff into um, into studio. So you know he's in a position. I look at that and I'm like, you know, that's that's a decision maker. Mm -hmm. Most you know, definitely. but um, but yeah, it ultimately it's about access. Yeah. You know, you want to be a position like a prince that mm -hmm. can move to Minnesota, that could live in Minnesota and not need to be in L.A. Yep. And ultimately it goes back to the work. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, quality, individuals yeah. like that mm -hmm. don't need to be anywhere. They don't need to be in L.A. They don't need all. to be in Atlanta. They're going to they're going to come to you or they're going to make sure that. You have a smooth ride if we need to bring you in for something. Speaking on that, so uh, I, I want to just because one of my next questions kind of delves into like a little bit of what Prince faced as an artist during his time. Um, I think that uh, he, during like the time that he had to change his name and everything, he was facing some issues regarding like how a lot of artists, at least of, especially of color, are treated in the industry. Artists in general, especially musicians, are really skewed. So, what are some of the things that you faced? And like just being uh, being a black man in the in the industry that you felt have been like resistance aside from like the stuff you mentioned earlier with like wanting to divorce, diversify a board like do you think that was some of the hindrance for you getting those callbacks or getting some of those getting into some of the spaces where people would have been like oh yeah we need you on our next film yeah you know it, a lot of it still boils down to decision makers mm -hmm. and you know a lot of roles are not necessarily there there are plenty of roles that could go to, to any ethnicity but depending on who's making that decision they're going to cast who they want Most you know it's still a private thing so mm -hmm. it's, it's their it's their completely project. control yeah they're allowed so they yeah. can do it so again it still boy it still it still goes back to diversifying where the decisions are made and some sometimes it could be blatant things and other times it could it could just be uh ignorance yeah you know um why would you cast that person to play a pharaoh yeah, you know, like, like that type of stuff. It's just, oh well, you know, they, that uh, was a no, no. It just doesn't no. make sense. It's yeah, <laughs> let, me, let me see who was in the room when that decision right. was being made. Yeah. You know, so it, it trickles down. So by the time you get to casting, you know, that's a byproduct. There's already three or four filters that it went through. Been made. But if you look at individuals that are performers mm -hmm. that can make those decisions, they usually have some brand equity. 
Yeah. You know, Will Smith. You see what he's, you know, what Most he's done with his Dave life Chappelle, and career. Yeah, Chappelle. people that can do more. I mean, even in the sports yeah. entertainment industry, look at LeBron. Like, yeah, he's doing a lot. You know, it's the same thing. The, the idea is that when individuals, un, when individuals believe that you are unaware, mm -hmm. that w when uh, they think they that you are not intelligent yeah. enough to understand, mm -hmm. whatever it is, it, has, it could be entertainment, uh, sports, other forms there's of a, business, like, yeah, when it, stuff, whenever yeah. an individual feels as though they have this power over you, then you're, and you're subservient, or that you are um, beholden to them in some mm -hmm. capacity, that's when, oh yeah, that album was cool, but you owe me three more albums. <laughs> that's a good way to put that. So for the final question, I think we're wrapping up here. The final question would be, there's a renaissance obviously going on in Chicago. You just made reference to it with saying like we keep breaking these revenue uh, revenue uh, records every single year for production. Um, so with this renaissance is obviously delving into all of the entertainment, comedy, music, uh, TV, film. Uh, what do you think is some of the best ideas we can do aside like in delving into the idea of collaboration? Like what can we do as a community of like independent entertainers to like really make sure that this like doesn't just like fizzle you know what I mean like and really explodes the way it should like like in Atlanta or in LA mm -hmm. or in New York uh, support one another and yes. so I, I'm very specific when I say that because I'm not just talking about collaborating mm -hmm. it's easy for me to support your project if I was yeah. a producer on your music video mm -hmm. so yes yes we need to collaborate but when your music video comes out I tell people all the time, like, it doesn't call, just click like, you know, something click as simple like, as that, or share it, or you. something yeah. of that nature. It could be something as simple as that, all the way up to, you know, all right, so-and-so, you know, that person having a listening party, I'm going to show up, I'm going to be supportive of them. Uh, unfortunately, our historically, our market has had this issue where you hit a ceiling and you have to leave, which is why so many yeah. of the dope artists leave. You're like, oh, they're from Chicago? They're from Chicago? Yeah, they moved 20 years ago. They, they moved 15 yeah, years they ago. Their head on Chicago the has yeah. never been, has never, ever, ever lacked talent. Never. Chicago has always been an incubator for talent. Mm -hmm. You mentioned comedy. Chicago's a comedy town. Second yes, City's here. Yep. Steppenwolf, Goodman Theater. Yep. Um, there's always been great institutions for performances. Mm -hmm. It's just been a matter of is there an infrastructure for those individuals to stay here and thrive? And there hasn't, so they have yeah. to leave. Now, Cinespace Studios has helped change a lot of that. Yes, There's a confidence that Chicago has. Um, and when the Dick Wolf shows came here, Chicago Fire being the first one, mm -hmm. networks started to trust more and more mm -hmm. that they could come to Chicago and film everything yeah. opposed to just shooting exterior scenes, yeah. so there are a lot of moving parts to it you got tax incentives there's a political side of it yep. to make sure that there's incentives in, in place but then to me I think the, the number one thing is just technology the idea that costs are not as prohibitive where you look at someone like a Issa Rae that started with yeah. Adventures of Awkward Black Girl as a mm -hmm. YouTube show YouTube and turned into, <laughs> you know, continued yeah. to propel her and turned it into now insecure first look deal. Mm -hmm. You look at people like Lena Waithe, who's from yep. Chicago. Um, you look at what Common is doing as a, as a musician and a that's turned into actor. an executive producer, yeah, an exactly. actor. Yep. Uh, Chance is doing more stuff. Uh, Even politically, so yeah. There's never been a lack of talent. Nope. It's just been a matter of a lack of access to resources, mm -hmm. and then the unfortunate, you know, the the unfortunate uh, deal of individuals not always um, being supportive of one another. So if yeah. you're an artist and you're coming up and you're saying you're giving it your all, mm -hmm. but man, I don't have access. I can't get anybody to come out and do you know anybody, so to speak. I'm gonna leave. Most definitely. And then. Next thing you know, they're like, oh, so-and-so just got cast in this. I know yep. actors that have moved away from Chicago. I know people, too, personally. Yeah. That when they moved, they got cast on a Chicago show that they couldn't get cast, cast on while they lived in Chicago. That's insane. <laughs> and some got, of that still happens, that, but, but ultimately, I think that um, when, you, when you can showcase that your brand has numbers, meaning that when you produce something, that there's a following for it, you have more leverage. And the confidence in what yeah. you're doing starts to grow. It definitely does. So you really have, we really have to support one another. Collaborate, it makes it easier to produce the work, but support the work, it makes it easier for it to sustain. That's true. Well, Troy, thank you so much for joining us today. Once again, 
This is Everyone Has a Story. I want to thank Brother Marcus again for having me out here as a host. I'm Terry Tokio. This is Terry Pryor. I'm Terry Disciple. And thank you so much for listening and watching.